Um, also, uh, tak fordi uh, I er kommet. I må skyld, skyld uh, mit engelsk, fordi mit første skandinaviske sprog var dansk. Og det er ikke ret nyt i her. Så so, jeg, skal, jeg, skal, uh, jeg skal tale engelsk til jer. Um, I hope you do not mind. Right. Um, so yeah, my name is Dennis Sukino Kamenko. And um, the project I'm presenting today started as a diploma thesis that I defended in Moscow in 2013. Uh, it has now been supervised by Hendrik Janssen, who unfortunately couldn't be here today with us uh, due to he- the teaching duties, as far as I understand, and Lars Hammonson. And the project bears a preliminary title, Viking Age Things in England and Scandinavia, uh, a comparative study. Um, To begin with, I have posed at least four major research questions that I'm willing to address. First of all, who were the Thanes? If you check up the existing historiography, the traditional answer will differ depending on the region. Um, In England, they're said to be either retainers, retainers of the kings, that is, but not only, or a kind of, well, proto-gentry, you might call them. And in Scandinavia, there has been an ongoing debate whether the Thanes we know uh, we know of were uh, retainers of the kings or local independent aristocracy. Um, which of the four opinions is uh, closest to V.S. Agintish um remains to be answered. Uh, but there are other questions too, such as were there any connections? Uh, did the term or concept of a thane evolve with time? Was there any mutual influence? And from my knowledge, the current historiography doesn't answer these questions, let alone pose them. Uh, why is this so? Well, I call it a historiographical vicious circle. There are three main approaches to the problem, each with its strong and weak sides, but they appear rather disconnected from each other. It is most apparent from the relationship between the Scandinavian and the British scholars. So the former do read the latter, second-hand works, that is. But the latter do not return the favor, and so to speak, it is a one-way dialogue, if a dialogue can be one way. Um, So what one of my objectives is, so to speak, is to tie the two traditions together. What I suggest is to start with a linguistic analysis then explore the least biased or influenced upon sources uh, from the respective regions, and then move on to the less clear-cut sources and finally try to reach a synthesis, if it is even possible. Uh, Methodologically, I rely on three main cornerstones or techniques. Uh, One is uh, context analysis. Instead of starting my research with applying the standard dictionary definition of a thane, I will rather try to find my own. Uh, This is important because the chronology of the extant source is of a paramount importance. A great many scholars tend to project the information of the younger source material onto the earlier epoch, which is hardly warranted, I say. Finally, I hope to exploit the databases that become more and more available these days. Bases, uh, Bases such as the electronic Sawyer, the... Oh, I'm sorry, I switched that. Uh, Electronic Soa, that is the collection of all extant Anglo-Saxon diplomas, can yield a lot of statistical data. I'll just bring one example here. You can see uh, this is a map I put together for my previous research. And it's a map of where the English things used to receive land grants from the kings and it has been put up by me with the help of the electronic sawyer, with the help of the information from the diplomas. Um, Another example, uh, this time from Scandinavia. Um, Here you can see a map of where the rune stones that mentioned Thanes are to be found. It has been first made available in 2001 by Bigger Sawyer, by the way, the late wife of Peter Sawyer, whose index of the Anglo-Saxon charters has been used for the database I just mentioned earlier. Um, You might ask me, uh, well, what does it all matter? 
Um, the way I see it, um, answering the research questions I brought up in the beginning can offer at least three main results. First, my humble source work can enrich our understanding of these sources. Um, I will give you a brief example. So, here's the map that I've shown you earlier. You can see that the land donations are very unevenly uh, distributed in England. This alone might lead you to certain conclusions, and I have drawn my conclusions, my diploma thesis, but aren't they premature? Let's look at, the, at where the corresponding charters have been preserved. <clears throat> A little detail here. The only archives that contain such charters in England of the period we are discussing are those of the monastic houses. By comparing the two maps, one might think they are very co correlated, which might be expected. But if we look at the map of the active ecclesiastical foundations around the year 1060, it won't match either of the two. So you can see that there clearly are some monastic houses and religious houses outside the regions where the things used to receive lands, or at least such conclusion can be drawn from those maps. Um, why is that? My point is that we need to pose the question of whether the extant corpus is representative. Something, as far as I know, hasn't been addressed on the larger scale. Um, the second result, I expect, is to add a new dimension to our understanding of how the two coasts of the North Sea were connected at the time. Uh, recently, has ever more been revealed that those were far from isolated from each other on the social level too. And finally, I hope that my, well, case study of sorts can offer one of the possible ways to transcend the disciplinary borders. Um, I hate to brag, but I hope that the fact that I'm a foreigner can actually become my gain here. I belong to neither of the historiographical traditions, and I humbly claim to offer a view from the outside. And with that being said, I thank you very much for coming and for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'm more than looking forward to answer them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, questions, comments? Wojtek? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, questions, but just simply. Uh, what exactly do you mean by statistical analysis in the context? Well, um, I cannot give you a definitive answer right now, but the way I see it is that instead of trying to pick single cases of when land was donated to that thing or the other thing, we should try to look at it from the um, bird's flight view, so to speak. We should, we should try to analyze all available charters and make a map uh, similar to one that I, for one, for example, made here and try to see where the land was donated. Why is this important? It is important because, on the one hand, the majority of the sources we have come from, the, uh, from one or the other way, Wessex, and you can see that there's a correlation. Wessex would be historically, historically would be here. Then you cut the English part of England, which is the Greater Wessex, which is roughly here. So there seem to be a correlation. But we also know that there existed things outside this region. Were those people who received the lands here, were they indeed connected to the kings? Because, I mean... If you put a chart together, you'll see that only like 14% of the land donations have been donated outside the Greater Wessex. Why is that? Will it, maybe it will yield some results. Maybe it won't. Um, the same thing is true for the Doomsday material. Unfortunately, I haven't got a map because I haven't fully assessed this uh, source. But um, it appears that the, word, uh, the things are mentioned very differently in the Doomsday book you will probably find many more of them outside this region. Why is that? I don't have a definitive answer yet. Um, so yeah, if that answers your question. So statistics can probably tell us where 
where this class group stratum was most prominent maybe why if it was connected to the kings it might give you an answer that the kings had the lands that are distributed here all, all sorts of things so to speak yeah Pablo? how many grants are you going to investigate and what is the distribution in time mm. This is a very good question, um, and this is a sort of an enigma in itself, because overall, electronic soil lists uh, almost 1900, but that includes all documents drawn uh, between roughly 600 and 1086, and that it leaves out the charters drawn by the Norman kings. But the interesting issue is that the types of charters are different, so we've got the diplomas, so those are uh, the solemn charters that donate land, or they rather test the land donation, but we've also got writs. Writs are very short um, addresses to the localities about a decision made by the king, and those are concentrated in the 11th century only. Uh, we've got wills, we've got um, bequests. Um, those, all of those must be analyzed, but I will probably not uh, start... Um, from, I don't know, the 7th century. Firstly, because there are too few. Secondly, because it's difficult. Thirdly, because it's beyond my scope. But uh, this map has been put together um, on the material of roughly, uh, let me recall, something like uh, 250. But there are also about 200 in favor of the church from the same period, and about... 200 in favor of other people, earls, um, reeves, uh, some people whose status we do not know. And so from, from my period, from, 10, from roughly 900 to 1066, there are about 650. And this, is also, this can also answer the statistical question. For example, does this map correlate with, with what we see how land was donated in favor of the church? Or does it correlate with how it was how it was distributed in favor of other people? Is there a connection? Is this unique, so to speak? I hope I answered your question. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yes, thanks. Mm-hmm. Yes, it seems like a very interesting project, and uh, it's in, in particular this cooperation with the Anglo-Saxon world and the Muslim world. But I have a question. Uh, in the presentation, it seems that you, for example, when you told us, you try you contextualize the ten inscriptions in the Anglo-Saxon and Norman you know, world, like for example, the Breton down uh, by Shires and by archives and the monastery houses, as you mentioned. But I wonder, do you plan to uh, contextualize or, or sort of um, analyze the runic material, the yeah. stone material, of course. in the same way, and in could you uh, explain a bit how you plan to do that? Um, now, let me see. Um, no, no, where is where? It's not the one. Um, thank you very much for this question. I was sort of waiting for it. Uh, can I please have this map? PowerPoint, will you? Um, what is that you can see? Yeah, um, this, is a, this is a very good question because this map has been put together by Bigger Soy. And uh, it poses lots of questions. Okay, we know that there are very few runestones in Norway itself, so it's not very surprising that we do not find any there. I mean, there are not many to begin with, but um, we know that um, the majority of the runestones are to be found in Sweden. And yet, we can see that (coughs) altogether there are about uh, 45, and 15 of them are in Denmark. So so, So to speak, the proportion is very much not representative, I think. Why is it connected? And those are supposed to be the early, uh, earlier than those in Sweden. So those in Sweden are roughly dated to the middle of the 11th century, while, the, while those in, uh, in Skåne and in Denmark are roughly dated to the end of the 10th century. Uh, the problem is the dating, because runestones do not offer much of a context. But um, again, there was, for example, a very interesting article by Judith Jesch, whom I'm very happy to know, who analyzed the um, uh, word thane on the runic inscriptions uh, in one of the, I think, in one of the regions around the lakes, in which she actually um, observed that there was a formula uh, 
a thing of strength, and she actually believes that it could be a canning. It could not reflect any social stratum or whatever. Um, again, this needs to be analyzed. The problem is that we've got all altogether there are about 50, whereas we have hundreds of charters. So uh, statistics does work, but is more problematic. Um, but it is of paramount importance because, as has been outlined by uh, Jan Paul Stry, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name, um, it was an article from 1986, as far as I remember, where he actually showed that linguistically the form in, the, in which the word Thane is recorded on the, on the Swedish runestones is definitely Swedish. Uh, it has undergone the breaking process. It's, it's something like Thiken or Thiken. Whereas in England you would expect a Thagen or something different. Which means that that wasn't a long word. And this is always, well, or very often overlooked by the British scholars. The British scholars do not seem to know about this map altogether. Which is very surprising. <laughs> I didn't know about it before I started my doctoral thesis. I thought they, were, they only existed in, in, in England. If that is the answer. Boy, thank you. Sorry, uh, uh, I will follow up sort yeah. of a mess as well, but just um, as you present it right now, it seems like a uh, fairly descriptive purpose of your thesis, right? Like, who were the things? What did they do, right? Uh, but is there any kind of broader or more general sociological question behind it? Yep. Uh, and could you elaborate on that? So because, like, in general, it's not very surprising that you will find differences between Scandinavia and, and in England, especially the worst determined in language, because they are actually very different societies in terms of power distribution and so on and so on, um, and level of literacy and so, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, so, is there some more general problem you want to tell us about with your thesis at the end of it? Well, um as I mentioned in my last slide, um, I think there are... I mean, first of all, I agree with you that we, we should expect to find discrepancies. Uh, the, the surprising fact is maybe how similar, actually, the results can be. But I cannot um, speak on this behalf right now. Um, and probably we should, add, um, we should probably invite Karl Loving, who has written a lot of works about things in, uh, in the runes, on the runestones. But... Um, I think um, what I'm trying to do is, well, beside the first point, um, what I'm trying to do is to, on the one hand, bring the historiographical traditions together. Because, again, as I said, they seem very detached from each other. And I see it as a problem. Because, as you said, the region was very much interconnected. But when the, uh, when the Anglo-Saxonists approached the Viking Age, the seed from their perspective, when the... Uh, Viking Age scholars see uh, address the Anglo-Saxon material they see it from their perspective. So, my case study can bring forward a way how to sort of transcend these borders. On the other hand, in uh, this is a historiographical dimension. In the historical dimension in itself, I hope to show that those societies might not have been as different, or maybe not as alike as we uh, we used to think, but also. Um, Maybe it can be a, f a founding stone for my later projects because it appears that the, these social models have been followed up on the continent and in, and, oh, in, in Russia too. And I hope that uh, I can elaborate on that later on. Um, for example, we know that there's a Russian word for a uh, Prince Reeve, um, Tiwun, which used to be credited to come from the word Thane. But in fact, it, is, it comes from the word for slave, the uh, uh, thir, and why is that? Also a very interesting question. So, plus, if I've got the time and if uh, Henrik and Lars allow me to, I would like to maybe have a little chapter or maybe sub-chapter connecting the material with, uh, for example, contemporary Germany, with the ministeriales. Did they fulfill the same roles? Did they operate as uh, king's agents? All sorts of, maybe even as far as, Jap as Japan with their samurai. But I think that would be a bit too far fetched. That would be a bit too far fetched. So, are there any more questions? Yeah, I 
I think we had to move on. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you.